Hello. Welcome back. I do hope that uh, you are finding the uh, summary that we've been providing up to date very useful. But you see, if you really want to pass your exam very well in terms of uh, reading, then you need to pay attention to the detailed discussions in the uh, slide that were provided much earlier. Because some exams could be in the form of uh, multiple choice questions and you needed to have read widely enough to be able to understand the issues at stake and be able to answer your questions in a multiple choice exam. So please do not ignore the detailed discussions in the slides and only focus on these summaries. And right now we are looking at the session 12, which focuses on industrialization and urbanization. Uh, the main focus of this discussion, the main trust, is to determine or to suggest whether there is some kind of a relationship or a causal nexus between industrialization and urbanization. The meaning is that if there is any such causal nexus, it will mean that if you see industrialization, there would be urbanization. And if you see urbanization, there should be industrialization. In other words, what we are trying to suggest ultimately is that is there this kind of uh, inevitable technical connection between the two variables, or they can be quite independent of each other. But we have to begin from the very beginning. In other words, we want to define the key concepts. And the key concept here is industrialization. The definition for this concept varies from writer to writer, but what we have selected here for discussion is that it refers to changes in productive technology, implying in a wider sense the technification of agriculture and of services. It means ultimately the application of inanimate sources of power to the production of goods and services. Now, inanimate sources of power refer to machines, the use of machines in the production process. Now, when you speak about changes in productive technology, it would mean that the kind of technology that we have today, that we often refer to as the state of the art technology, has gone through a process of evolution from earlier times until it became what it is today that we're using. For example, the mobile phone, for example, computers, and many other technologies that are available today which are a state of the art. But how did it all begin? This is the reason why we speak about changes in productive technology as being the definition of industrialization. We can trace the origin from early man. Who was early man? Homo sapiens. In other words, the, the group of people who had absolutely no scientific knowledge but they had been created or they evolved into the environment and they have to survive. Now, survival for early men was the practice of hunting and gathering. They had to eat because if you do not eat, you would perish. So how did they survive through hunting and gathering? It has to be through technology. Early man found himself in an environment and the only thing that he can see around him were, let's say, stones and uh, trees. In other words, wood and stones were available, possibly for uh, the development of a technology, principally to enable him to hunt effectively and, and gather effectively. Remember, this was the Stone Age. So the kind of technology available then was uh, stone axes, a stone spears and stone knives. All of these, all of these three, if you take a stone axis, it enable the, uh, the early man to be able to cut things which he wanted to cut otherwise. Stone knives enable him to cut into smaller pieces and then the stone spears were available to him to use in the hunting process. And, and all of these were attached to pieces of wood if you can imagine the process. You should go to an, a museum to be able to see samples of these stone axes, stone spears, and stone knives, which are still available today, 
for us to see the kind of technology that early man used. Well, nomadism meant no permanent settlements, in other words. People were moving from one place to another, hunting and gathering. The meaning is that if they came to, let's say, point A, they were able to live there for about a week, and they ate nearly everything that was available as food in that uh, environment, then they had to move to point B, where they stayed for a number of days until the food resources there were equally depleted and then they had to move to point C. This was the kind of survival that they were practicing and their technology was basically st stone technology. That kind of existence persisted until the 10th century BC when we had what was known as the Neolithic Revolution. The Neolithic Revolution was quite significant in the sense that this was the time that organized agriculture was discovered. I remember hitherto people were leaving from, uh, you know, gathering and hunting. Suddenly, early man discovered that the pieces of plants that he left on the soil, like seeds that dropped on the soil after he's eaten uh, the, the fruits, and maybe a twig of a cassava stick, that fell on the soil and uh, was left behind. When it came ultimately back, they discovered that those plants and seeds were growing up. So they began to wonder if we can stay around this area and put more of these seeds and twigs into the soil, maybe we can wait until they mature for harvesting. This was how uh, agriculture was discovered accidentally by seeing that thing that were left on the, in the soil began to germinate. So it was possible that people can stay around in one place and grow these crops until they were fully uh, matured for harvesting. This was the beginning of uh, early settlements. And what became quite significant as a result of these early settlements was that if you are no longer moving around from place to place looking for animals and the fruits to harvest or kill, and you were settled in one place, it meant that you had a lot of time on hand. What was early man going to do with that, uh, uh, that time that was available to him? He spent the time trying to socialize or bring up his children. He spent that, uh, enough time or extra time, if you like, to domesticate animals, like uh, goats were, you know, like living wild, sheep were living wild, cows were living wild, chicken were living wild. All of these were brought together and domesticated so that today we're having those animals as uh, domestic animals and they're living with us wherever we are, including the dog. Domestication of the dog also took place during the Neolithic Revolution as a result of the ability of people to settle in one place to grow crops and to harvest them. That was the beginning of uh, the building of early settlements, smaller villages expanding to towns because of the population explosion. These towns ultimately matured into cities. This is how cities grew up from villages to towns, from towns to cities. Now, Gordon Child christened this kind of change as the urban revolution because, according to him, it meant total transition, a total transformation of traditional values into modernity, which is the urban area. The Neolithic revolution persisted until the discovery of iron happened at about 1000 BC. Now, iron was the main reason why industrialization came into being, because as a result of iron, a lot of improvements were available to the human being to be able to subdue his environment much more effectively. The first thing that we noticed was that because of the presence of iron, it was possible to improve on transportation. Either to, it was not easy for early people 
to transport themselves or their goods to other places very easily. But with the availability of iron, it was possible to invent a wheel, which was then used to uh, make the possibility of traveling in chariots or cutting goods from one place to the other. So effective transportation became possible as a result of the discovery of iron. The reference was made to the invention of many things, including uh, coins, the writing, the calendar, as was noted by uh, the, uh, the writers on the early culture. In addition to inventions, we had uh, very effective tools being produced, which were effective in the sense that they were sharper and much more durable, and also helped so much in the productive process. Finally, as a result of iron, the invention of machines became possible. I remember machines were the main reason why we had uh, the Industrial Revolution. Now, I made reference just a little while ago to the fact that uh, the Neolithic Revolution led to settlement of people. Now, with the discovery of iron, it was even easier for societies to develop. This led to certain notable societies, particularly we can make reference to uh, Athens, Greece, as well as Rome. These were city-states at the time. They were able to survive because they had well-organized agriculture, which was able to feed the people. Agriculture was quite important. Without food, cities cannot survive. Additionally, they have manufacturing facilities which we were able to produce a lot of goods for the survival of the people as well as well-developed political systems. You remember the, the emperors of Rome. Those were the uh, political institutional uh, officers who made sure that law and order was maintained and the appointment of people to positions and assignment of these people, assignment of power to these people. So politically, those, those cities, Ethan and Rome, were very well developed. And they survived additionally because they had very well organized healthcare delivery systems, which enabled them to prevent diseases and to treat diseases if they should occur. Rome, in particular, was identified as having fulfilled much of the prerequisites for a well developed, well organized city. According to the writers at the time, Rome had about 28 libraries in second century AD, 28 libraries, 500 fountains, and 10,000 statues. Now, if you're looking at Rome in second century AD, and you want to compare Rome second century AD to Accra 21st century, then you can see the difference. 28 libraries, 28 public libraries. If you want to count, count the libraries in Accra and see the difference. 500 fountains and 10,000 statues. This is the kind of situation that Gordon Chow was speaking about, particularly reference to monumental architecture as a major prerequisite for the survival and the functioning of cities. Rome had all of those at the time, pretty early. And uh, what I'm trying to say is, is that the emperors of Rome at the time they spent much of the resources, financial resources that came to the, to the city on civic constructions. They went out of their way to try and make the city look good, look beautiful. This is the sense in which they had all of those fountains that when you get around in Rome in the evening or in the morning or whatever time, you feel at peace with yourself because of the existence of all of these facilities which make you feel that you are living in a very exciting place. Basically, the Industrial Revolution began in England in the 18th century, spreading to other parts of Europe in the 19th century. Now, when we speak about the Industrial Revolution, we are speaking about the technification or mechanization of agriculture and the application of inanimate sources of power to the pr pr production of goods and services. 
What does that mean? A technification of agriculture meant that uh, farming was now done exclusively, if you like, using machines. The demonstration is like this, that if you had a farm which you were hitherto cultivating yourself, and, uh, or you hired about 10 laborers to work on that farm. Now, with the availability of machines to you, it's going to take only one person to work on that farm. It means that nine other people have been made redundant. Now, if you, uh, Kofi and Kojo, also has a machine or a plow, and Kweku also has a plow, it means that people are being forced off the land gradually. This is the reason why people began to leave the rural agricultural areas to come to the cities because they have been made redundant in the sense that they don't have anything doing, no jobs available. Because machines have taken over the jobs of uh, human beings. So they came over to the urban areas looking for greener patches or for wage paid labor. Basically, this was the impact of the technification of agriculture as a result of the Industrial Revolution on people forcing them to have to leave the rural area to the urban areas. In the meantime, the manufacturing industries in the urban communities were creating all kinds of jobs which require manpower. And this was the reason why people were actually leaving the rural areas to come looking for these jobs. It meant as well that the urban communities, which have become industrialized, were a major reason to attract people from the rural countryside to come to the urban areas where they can hope to get employment. Basically, that means that there is some kind of a relationship between uh, industrialization and urbanization. It is the urbanization which is occurring, the agglomeration of people in the urban area is occurring because there are industries in the urban area attracting people to come over. That appears to mean that there is some kind of a technical connection between the two variables. If you have industrialization, you're going to be having urbanization because people would move over to the, urban, to the industrial areas looking for jobs leading to the agglomeration or accumulation of people in those urban areas, in those industrial areas, creating urbanization in the process. So there is an obvious connection. But is that true in all cases? Is there a possibility that we can have an urban area without industry? Or is it possible we can have an industrial area without urban agglomerations? This is the main thrust of the discussion, as I said much earlier. Now, it is possible. In other words, the two variables are quite independent of each other. Let's take some illustrative examples in our own country. Cape Coast. If you've been to Cape Coast before, it is an urban area, and it's saying that there is uh, quite an accumulation of people, a concentration of people, for a variety of reasons. Cape Coast originally was the capital city of this country when the colonialists came. It was where the colonialists be began to administer the Gold Coast from. So a lot of uh, jobs were being created in Cape Coast at the time. These were administrative jobs in the colonial offices. So people began to move from other areas of the country to come to Cape Coast to settle there and to find jobs there. This was part of the reason for the migrations leading to the accumulation of people in Cape Coast. But apart from that, the colonialists supported the missionaries to establish a number of good schools in Cape Coast. St. Augustine's College, for example, Holy Child, Wesley Girls, Infancipium, all of these A-class uh, secondary institutions were established in Cape Coast, as a result of which a lot more younger people were migrating to Cape Coast for their educational purposes. This led to the accumulation of people or the concentration of people or the agglomeration of populations within the Cape Coast uh, municipality. But Cape Coast is not industrialized. If you've been there before, it is not a place that you would call an industrial city. So here we have an example of uh, urbanization 
without industrialization. Cape Coast illustrates that. You want to look at the example of a place where there are industries but without urban agglomerations, and we want to go to a little place known as Bangure, where kente is manufactured. I don't know how many of you may have gone there before. I was there and I was quite surprised that you enter the town and at the early stages of your entry, you began to see all kinds of looms. And when you reach the city center and you stand, you see ahead of you looms, you turn your eye leftwards or rightwards, you see looms, and you turn backwards, you see looms all over the place. And people were very busy, you know, working at those looms. Now, the looms, they do represent an inanimate source of power for the production of kente. So that's a typical example of industrialization. But when you look at Bonguri as a settled area, it's a very small community. There are no urban agglomerations in Bonguri, but it is highly industrialized in the sense that it has those machines which were being used for the production of uh, kente. So those are two illustrations which you want to look at. There may be other illustrations which are identifiable in Ghana which you may want to also consider if you have any kind of question on this particular issue.